I love weddings, but if I'm being very honest with all of you, I have to confess that I prefer funerals to weddings. Now, before you think I'm crazy and I've lost my mind, let me, let me just hear me out, let me explain myself. Weddings are lovely, happy occasions, but every wedding, every single wedding has drama. Lots of drama. There is always something that goes wrong. At my own wedding, it was the bridal veil that got left on the complete opposite side of town. (laughs) Someone had to be dispatched to go fetch the bridal veil and bring it back. I have seen bridesmaids tumbling down during the vows. I've seen sound systems crash in the middle of services. I have seen everything happen. But there was one wedding that I was in. I was not doing the wedding, but I was in the wedding, and it was like a comedy of errors. Everything that could go wrong was going wrong. So the pastor had told us all, he said, I want you there one hour before the start of the service. So I took this very seriously. I was one of the groomsmen. You know, I made sure that all the groomsmen knew and the the groom knew. I made sure everybody knew we had to be there an hour beforehand. So I show up at the venue where we're having the wedding one hour early, and I'm the only person there. There is no pastor, there is no bride, there is no groom. (laughs) So I start calling people, and about 15 minutes later, one of the bridesmaids, the sister of the bride, comes up to me and she says, we've just realized that we have no ice at all. We have no ice for the reception. And so we need you, I'm wearing a tux at this point, we need you to go buy all the ice that you can find from the surrounding gas stations and bring it back here so that we have ice for the reception. And so, um, so I'm in a tux, and this is taking place in Orlando, Florida in July. So if you've never experienced Orlando, Florida in July, it's similar to hell, only a little hotter. So, so I'm running around throwing bags of ice into, into this, this car that we had, and I'm just filling it up with ice, running it back, doing trips back and forth. I get all the ice there, and then the sister of the, the bride comes up to me and she says, we don't know where the caterers are. They are completely lost. Um, and they think they're in the area, but so she's like, can you go outside and find them? So I'm running around blocks, doing concentric circles around the area until I find the catering van to guide them back to the location where the venue was. So this is all before the wedding has even started. I'm sweating profusely. I look like I've just been standing in a rainstorm um, before the start of this wedding. And what I, I tell you that story is to tell you is that that is not extraordinary for a wedding. Every wedding has something go awry. And there's no exception in our gospel reading this morning. In this story, there is a little problem at the wedding. The host of the wedding reception has run out of wine. Some of you might think that's a big problem, a very big problem. And Mary notices this, and informs her son of the little problem. There's no more wine. Don't you just love this interaction between Mary and Jesus? I really love the way that they interact with each other. You know, Mary is this, the epitome of the Middle Eastern mother, you know, comes over and, and just casually notices, doesn't, doesn't order her son to do anything, just, you know, makes kind of a, a, a suggestion, says, oh, have you noticed that there's no wine, Jesus? It's kind of like the way your mom notices Um, When you haven't uh, gotten a haircut recently, that doesn't happen for me. My mom doesn't notice when I haven't gotten a haircut, but uh, anymore, at least. Or when when your mom notices that you didn't call to thank Aunt Betty for the Christmas gift that she gave you. Anyway, so she notices that there's no more wine, implying to Jesus that he do something about it. And Jesus has this kind of strange response to his mother. You know, he says, woman, you know, what, what is that to me? Um, My hour has not yet come. And he seems to rebuff her. But Mary tells the servants to do whatever Jesus says anyway. I I just want to make a brief aside here. Megan Megan mentioned this to me yesterday. Um, Just a brief aside here. I think this is a wonderful analogy for prayer. A wonderful analogy for prayer, right? That that we we tell what we're we're doing is we're cooperating with 
with Jesus. We don't, we don't have power to change anything. We know that. And, and we can't order Jesus to do anything. But we can, we can point out what's happening that we see and say, Lord, you, you have the power to do something about this. Um, and so, so I, I just point that out as an aside for how we cooperate with God in prayer. Um, and that's what we see Mary kind of modeling for us here. But anyways, that, that's an aside. I'm not going to talk more about that. But anyway, so Jesus, he, he fills, has these servants fill six jars with water. And we'll come back to that. We'll come back to why that's important. And it's miraculously transformed into wine. So simple problem, no wine. You got the God of the universe on your side. Simple solution, change the water into wine. The problem is solved and the wedding goes on. Now, it would be very easy to just read this as a little story about how Jesus saved this couple's special day from disaster by turning water into wine. And he didn't even have to run around in July in Orlando like I did. But John concludes this story by telling us that there's something far greater going on here. Look at verse 11. Here's what he says. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. There is something far more important happening in this short little story than just a party rescue. What is this first sign? What is the sign? And how did this miracle, turning water into wine, how did that manifest the glory of Jesus? Our story has lots of little details that tell us what's really happening here. And these details tell us something profound about a much bigger story that is contained in this little short story. This bigger story is about God solving the problem of a creation that has been cut off from its creator. So I'm going to explain that to you this morning. It's explaining, it's talking about a story where the creation has been cut off from its creator and what God is going to do about it. So first, the bigger story is about Jesus beginning a new creation. We see this in the first little detail that's very easy to miss. John begins the story by saying, on the third day. You notice that? Starts right at the beginning, on the third day. That's how our passage starts this morning. On the third day. Nowhere else in the gospel does John tell time in this way. There's nowhere else he does it. Just here. But his readers would have known immediately that something else happened on the third day. What would they have known happened on the third day? Yeah, Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. And they would have said that every time they gathered for worship. So later on in our service, we'll say the Nicene Creed today. Um, together, we say the Nicene Creed every Sunday, just like they would have said some sort of profession of the faith. They would have said, on the third day, he rose again. And so when they hear this phrase, on the third day, immediately they'd be thinking of resurrection. John is signaling for us, he's putting that phrase in there for us, to let us know that he's talking about something much bigger. He's foreshadowing the resurrection story, that Jesus is going to do something that manifests his glory in the same way that his resurrection from the dead did. So how does making wine at a wedding manifest Jesus' glory, and what does it have to do with new creation? Well, throughout the Old Testament, wine was a sign of God's abundant provision for people. You know, as, as Father Justin pointed out, water is good, but wine is very good, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> water is great if you need to quench your thirst, but wine is about abundance. During hard times for the people of Israel, it was a sign. Wine became this symbol of God's promised redemption. The prophets would tell God's people, you know, when they're going through something really hard, he said, one day you're going to have wine again. Right now, your village is burned. Everything is bad. But one day you will have wine again. 
And both Jews and Christians, wine is part of the promised renewal of creation when God makes all things new. So in the new creation, there is wine. Isaiah 25, 6 through 8 says, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. He will swallow up death forever. So wine is part of resurrection living. When Jesus was sharing communion before he died, he told his disciples, Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So he's telling them, I'm drinking wine with you now. The next time I have, will have wine with you is when we're drinking it together in the kingdom of God. There's a great feast with wine in the kingdom of God. We will spend eternity feasting and rejoicing with with delicious food and rich wine. That's what we believe as Christians. Wine was a luxury item. In order to make wine, it meant that you had extra time to cultivate grapes because all of your other needs were were being met. You didn't grow grapes to survive, right? You grew grain to survive. You grew and cultivated grapes over years because you had such good provision of your basic needs that you had the capacity to spend time cultivating something that would take years to produce fruit. And then once it produced fruit, you had the time, the excess time it took to take that fruit and make it into juice and age it until it becomes alcohol and wine that you could enjoy. It means that you had extra time on your hands to spend. Having wine was a sign that God's blessing was on the land. And so when Jesus miraculously provides abundant and very good wine, it's a sign of God's blessing. This is why our reading from Isaiah is so critical to help us understand what this story is really all about. I'm so glad in the New Lectionary they tie these two readings together. Look at Isaiah 62, verse 4. Here's what the prophet says. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. Here's what this this prophecy is about. The creation has undergone, the land, the earth, has undergone a great divorce. When you read the account in Genesis, you hear the phrase heavens and earth repeated over and over. It's it's two halves of a whole, the heavens and the earth, the heavens and the earth. They're joined together. You get the sense that heaven and earth are inseparable. And from the beginning, heaven and earth were were created to be joined together permanently. Just as in marriage, and this is where the analogy is, just as in marriage, Two people are designed to be joined together permanently. And one way to understand the story of creation is that before sin, it was an extended wedding reception. It was a great big party. Adam and Eve were there, right? The first married couple. And they're enjoying each other. They're enjoying God's abundant provision. Humanity, nature, and God were coexisting in perfect harmony No one was worried about whether there would be enough food to eat. Creation was a giant party. But then something terrible happened. Sin ripped heaven and earth asunder. In the same way that Adam and Eve separated from each other and hid from one another, right? Hid themselves from one another. Heaven and earth ripped apart as sin entered God's creation. The creation became divorced from its creator, separated. And so this prophecy in Isaiah is about a new marriage, a coming back together between heaven and earth, between the creator and his creation. Jesus is the solution to the problem of the separation. Jesus came to reunite heaven and earth. Jesus came to renew the marriage between heaven and earth. And that's why the first sign he performs is at a wedding. 
right? It's a symbol, it's a sign of what he came to do, his central mission, rejoining heaven and earth. So this brings me to the second part of the bigger story. Jesus, right, if he's, he's doing it at a marriage, is the bridegroom. He's the one that's marrying the bride as heaven is married to earth. Look with me at John 2, verse 10. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. The master of the feast credits the bridegroom with Jesus's miracle. He thinks that the good wine starts flowing at the end of the party is, is coming from the bridegroom. The bridegroom did it. And actually, he's right. The master of the feast just has the wrong bridegroom. Jesus is the bridegroom. One chapter after our gospel story, John the Baptist says that Jesus is the bridegroom. John 3, 29. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, that's, he's referring to himself, who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. In other words, what John is saying there is, I've, I've seen the bridegroom, and I'm the friend of the bridegroom, and so now I'm filled with joy. Throughout the gospel, Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom. We see this image of God as the bridegroom in our Old Testament reading. Isaiah 62, 5, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The reason why Jesus makes all this wine at the wedding is because he's genuinely rejoicing over his people. Even though he say, says that his time has not yet come, his, his joy overflows and the wine pours out. Jesus came to a world that was in big trouble. It had been cut off from God, separated from God and from each other. And he loves the world so much that in his rejoicing over creation, he stretches out his arms and the wine pours out. For us, his blood pours out, right? He loves them so much, he pours out his blood for them. I want to show you a painting that I think beautifully illustrates this. This is um, the wedding feast at Cana by uh, an Italian artist named Paolo Veronese. He painted it in 1563. There is a lot happening in this, and I just want to be clear, this is not historically accurate to what a first century wedding would have looked like. This is a good representation of what a 16th century Venetian fancy wedding would have looked like, uh, not a first century Palestinian wedding. But but there's rich theology embedded in this painting, and I, I, I really was blessed by it. I want to share it with you. Um, I want to zoom in on one part of the painting. Can we get that zoom in? Okay, so at the center of the table is seated Jesus. Now, you guys have been to weddings. Who's usually seated at the center of the head table? The bride and groom. The bridegroom, right, is seated at the center. But instead... Jesus is seated where the bridegroom should be. And the bride and bridegroom at the wedding are seated off as guests at the wedding, okay? So that's the first thing he's done, right? He's, he's put Jesus in the center. And directly above Jesus, I don't know if you can see this. Can you guys see that up above what, what that is? Directly above him, what do you see in that guy's hand? A knife. And what's going on in there, and I know it's kind of hard to make out, is he's actually cutting a lamb. He's taking a knife to a lamb right above Jesus. Directly above Jesus is a man cutting a roasted lamb, the Passover lamb. Jesus is seated at the table as the bridegroom, as the one who lays down his life for the bride. The creator who loves his creation so much, he lays down everything for her the Passover lamb, the savior who so loves his bride, he pours out his blood like wine flowing at a wedding to cover all our sins. What a rich painting that is. Hebrews says that Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. 
You are part of that joy. Jesus endured the cross because he saw you and loved you and poured everything out. Let his blood flow like wine because he rejoiced over you. He loved you that much. Do you know that? Do you know this joyful, extravagant love of the bridegroom? Third, Jesus' miracle shows us that he is bringing unending joy. One of the details that we might overlook is just how much wine Jesus created. It would have been, in the story, about 120 to 180 gallons of wine, which is equal, uh, I'll put that into bottles because we use bottles in our culture, that's about 1,000 bottles of wine, okay? If you ever have a party where they consume 1,000 bottles of wine, um, you may need to have a talk with some of your friends because they have a serious problem. <laughs> um, that is a lot of, that is an absurd amount of wine. No one, no party could consume a thousand bottles of wine. I don't even think like New Year's Eve in Times Square that much alcohol is consumed. So why does he do it? Why does he make that much wine, that absurd amount of wine? Well, as I noted earlier, in the Bible, wine symbolizes joy. And Jesus talks about this new wine that he came to bring. And on the night before he was handed over, he, he took wine and made it a sign of God's abundant provision of forgiveness. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus is making all this wine as a symbol to say, my blood will cover all the sins of the whole world. It is enough. It is more than enough. Jesus uses wine to show us that all of our sins, all of our sorrows are covered by his blood. His blood is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. His forgiveness never runs out. There will always be enough. And so our joy never runs out. In John 15, 11, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Jesus came to give us abundant joy. The whole creation has been waiting for Jesus, the bridegroom, to come. We, we read about that in our psalm, about the creation rejoicing when the creator comes. There's this quote, love this, Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the field be joyful. The, the trees of the wood are shouting for joy. When the Lord comes, there's joy. When heaven comes on earth, the earth rejoices, just like we party at a wedding. C.S. Lewis wrote, I, I shared this on Christmas Eve, joy is the serious business of heaven. That's the business of heaven, is bringing joy on the earth. A few years ago, I went to, um, I went to a conference up in North Carolina with a good friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, and he, um, he's, he's a bit older than me, and he's, he's got... Bad knees, really bad knees. Uh, those of you who are a little older or maybe experienced those kind of creaks and pops, well, his are extreme creaks and pops. It is bone on bone. And so, uh, you know, but he loves, he loves being in nature. And so a group of us were going for a hike, and he said, he's like, oh, I'd love to come with you. And I was kind of surprised. I was like, are you sure you want to come with us? Because we're hiking up a mountain, you know? And, and I knew about his knees, and he, he shared with me about that. And so it's a, it was a pretty strenuous hike up this mountain. And so the whole time I was a little bit concerned about my friend and I kept on looking over at him and, and just being concerned for him because I knew it, it was probably painful. But every time I'd look back at him, he was just kind of smiling and chatting and you know we were telling stories as we walked up this mountain. And as we went along, he would occasionally just interrupt our conversation and, and look at the valleys and the mountains and look at him and just say, you know, bless you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, this is so beautiful. He would just kind of rejoice. And he started like occasionally like singing little hymns and praising the Lord as we were hiking up this mountain. And, um, and so we get back from the hike and uh, I asked my friend, you know, how was, how was the hike for you? And I said, you know, I'm, I'm just so glad that you didn't have any pain in your knees for this hike. What a miracle that is that you were able to do this hike with us and not have any pain. And he said, oh, I, I was in terrible pain the entire time. It was, it was awful pain, but I had joy for the journey. And I love that. I love that. I've held on to that for years since he said that to me. Do you have joy for the journey? 
The joy that Jesus gives is a never-ending well. It will never run dry. It will never end. Some of you this morning are in the midst of great hardship and trial. Nothing is working out in your life. Everything is, you know, seemed like it was going fine, um, and then bam, it's not going fine. The wine has run out. Your life has been interrupted by tragedy. Your finances are a mess. Your marriage is struggling. Your kids are giving you grief. You're lonely and fearful about the future. You're worried during the day. It's, it's waking you up in the night, and your mind can't stop spinning in the late hours of the night. God wants to give you joy for the journey. Jesus has joy for you. He died for you. He poured out his blood for you. He has forgiven all your sins. And what that means is that at any moment, no matter what we're going through, we can have joy because we know that everything has been forgiven us. He's washed us and made us clean. If we believe in him, we believe that he is making all things new. He's making us new. This gives us joy, even in our most difficult circumstances. Maybe things are going well for you right now. Everything is actually going right. I want to encourage you. Don't get so lost in enjoying life that you miss the joy of life. Don't settle for an enjoyable life. Seek a life that is overflowing with abundant joy. Percy Shelley uh, the famous poet once wrote this, I have drunken deep of joy and I will taste no other wine tonight. We live in an era when the wine has run out. We have all faced some interruptions, some surprise interruptions and unexpected things these last two years. But now I want to say to you, the new wine has come and is being poured out. May we be reminded of that bigger story, even as we face struggles and trials. We are at the wedding feast of the Lamb. Jesus is here to make a new creation, to be our bridegroom, to pour out his life, to give us joy. Amen.